Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. Can we identify that this is an overlapping sets question? And if so, how? What are some words in the question stem that would help you identify that? These two and these two. Paperback written in Spanish. So that would be the top left cell in my Carol diagram. That's right. Let's build that Carol's diagram. It's probably a good idea to build it before we get to the question mark. In fact, I'd, I'd probably stop reading here. And at that point, I would build the diagram, Carol's diagram. So let's go ahead and do that. Can everyone confirm for me that English and Spanish are mutually exclusive, but collectively exhaustive? Uh, mutually exclusive means you can't have a book that both that's both English and Spanish. Can't be both. And collectively exhaustive means all of the books are either one, one of those. You don't have any in German or any other language. Does that make sense based on what they told us in the question? So for short, that's called MECE, M-E-C-E, Mutually Exclusive, Collectively Exhaustive. You'll learn that in business school if you haven't already learned it. Um, and then the same goes for hardcover and paperback. I'm gonna actually put paperback first to match what I said earlier about the position. I'm just doing this because of what I said earlier about how the question they're asking about is in the top left corner and there's the total. The other thing I can do before continuing to read is this. Right, so the total number of books is 45. Now I'm ready to keep reading. If a book is to be selected at random from the books on the shelf, so the importance of that phrase from the books on the shelf, that's very important because that gives you the denominator for the probability that they're about to ask about. So that, ma that maps to 45. If it didn't say from the books on the shelf, if it said from the English books on the shelf or from the Spanish books on the shelf, then it wouldn't be 45 in the denominator, it would be some other number. So it's very important. This is the attention to detail that I was talking about earlier. So out of what? Out of the books on the shelf. So out of 45, what is the probability, or rather is the probability less than half that so let's pause again after the word that and ask ourselves, what kind of numbers would have a probability of less than half? So out of 45, what's the cutoff? What's the maximum number of books out of 45 that would still give you less than half? 22. 22 is the cutoff. Because if you go to 23, well, that's already more than half. But 22 is the last one that's still less than half. So I'm going to make a little rephrase here, fewer than 23, 23 would already give us a no, but anything fewer than 23 is a yes. Anything fewer than 23 would be less than half of 45. So I did a little rephrase before I keep reading. So is it true that fewer than 23 of the books are paperback in Spanish? In other words, we are wondering whether or not this number is less than 23. That's what the question is asking. So can I, can you let me know in the chat box whether you think that you could have done what I just did, you know, with the pausing and the making the inferences? Could you have done that? I don't know if everybody noticed, but Himanshu said something really important that connects back to what we were talking about earlier. Himanshu said, when I first saw this question, I didn't think about using this double set matrix, this Carroll's diagram. Why? Because I saw the word probability and panicked. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically, that's what I heard from Himanshu. Do you see how that relates to the conversation that we had in the beginning of this hour? If you go into a question and you quickly try to read as quickly as possible to the question mark so that you can categorize, right, fit it in the appropriate bucket as early as possible, you're off to a bad start. And look at how different my approach was. I didn't even know, I didn't even see the word probability until after I already had this double set matrix. And when I saw the word probability, I, I saw, okay, it's a yes, no question asking, is the probability less than half? 
and I ask myself, well, under what circumstances would the probability be less than half when you're choosing at random from the 45 books on the shelf? So I have everything I need in order to make these inferences and in order to do this rephrasing. And I don't think that it's a stroke of genius. I think that it's just a willingness to take my time and a curiosity, a curious mindset to take that pause and to think about what that means. What would it mean for the probability to be less than half when you're choosing at random from 45 books on a shelf? And that's why I asked you to let me know in the chat box, do you think that you could have done what I just did? Because I'll tell you the truth, I think every one of you could have done that. With experience, it will be clearer and clearer to you when to use this visualization and how to use it appropriately, how to use it correctly. All right, so remember, I asked a very important question there. Can you confirm that Spanish and English are Misi? Can you confirm that paperback and hardcover are Misi? Right, you, you can't be a paper, paperback book and also a hardcover book. You can't be both at the same time. If you're a book, you can't be both paperback and hardcover. It's one or the other. And if you're a book, you can't be neither paperback nor hardcover. There's no third option, at least not for these 45 books. I'm not a professional bookbinder. I don't know if there are other options, but we were told for these 45 books, those are the only two options. So I confirmed that they're Misi. I confirmed that these are Misi. And now I know that I'm using this visualization correctly and appropriately. And I rephrase the question to, is this number less than 23, yes or no? Where you see the red dot right now, that would be the sum of these two cells. That's just how this visualization works. And where the dot is right now, that would be the sum of these two cells. Right? So if this cell is the hardcover Spanish books, and this is the hardcover English books, this would be the total hardcover books, regardless of the language they're in. And then similar here, this is the total number of Spanish books. So it would be the sum of these two cells. And finally, this would be the sum of these two cells. Okay, so now let's read the statements. I'll start with statement one just because it's statement one. They, they seem pretty similar in terms of difficulty. So it says, of the books on the shelf, 30 are paperback. So what can I do with that little piece of information? I can put 30 in the appropriate position, which would be right there. So now I know that this is 30. And what I ask myself is, knowing, knowing this, I could infer at this point that this is 15. I'm not sure how that would help me though. Knowing that this is 30, can I definitively answer which side of 23 this is on? Can I tell whether that number is less than 23 or not less than 23? No, I can tell that it's no more than 30, because 30 is apparently the sum of these two cells. So it can't be more than 30, but it could be up to 30, and including 30, so it doesn't answer my question. I don't know whether it's less than 23 or not less than 23. And then we can eliminate the answer choices that claim that statement 1 is sufficient on its own. So A and D are gone. So now I have to forget that this ever happened. I no longer have this piece of information about the 30. And by the way, uh, on the actual test, I would use my finger, which is usually a bit sweaty from, from uh, nerves of taking the GMAT, and I would just erase the, the number 30 from the yellow pad that they give you there. And now I'm looking at statement two on its own. So what do I know from statement two on its own? Exactly 15 in Spanish. So let me put that in here. Exactly 15 are in Spanish. Is it still possible for this number to be on either side of 23? Or does this new piece of information force the answer to be on one side of 23? And the answer is yes, it does force it. It forces it to be at most 15. This number here is the upper limit for each of these cells. So this answers the question definitively. I can now say that the number that they're asking about is at most 15, and therefore, yes, it is less than 23. So now I have the correct answer, which turns out is B. I don't consider this a probability question. And maybe that's why I always tell people there is no combinatorics and probability on the GMAT anymore, because if this came up on my test, I wouldn't look at that as a probability question.
I would look at that as an overlapping sets question, if anything. What what about this question makes it probability? I mean, is it is it really unreasonable to expect people who finished high school and an undergraduate degree to not know that a probability of less than half means that fewer than half of the books are of this type? I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure my son, who is almost seven, would know that a probability of less than half when choosing a random book for, out of 45 means that no more than 22 of them are this thing that they're asking about. I'm pretty sure he would know. And if he doesn't know, then he will know in a year or two. So this is not a probability question. It's a double set matrix question. He wouldn't be able to solve this question because he's not familiar with this visualization. But the probability part of the question, he understands. Does that make sense? Like, do, do, you, do you guys see why I wouldn't consider this to be a probability question? And to Taha's comment there in the chat, exactly. I spend a lot of time reading the question. And notice, Taha, I didn't spend a lot of time on the statements. The statements were very easy to evaluate by the time I got to them. And that's usually the case in data sufficiency. I'll spend, I'll be happy to spend close to two minutes before I even evaluate the statements. Why? Because I know that if I do a good job, then the statements will be very quick to evaluate. And if I don't do a good job, then when I get to the statements, I'll know that I didn't do a good job, or I'll know the question was too hard for me, and then I'll guess and move on. And that's an important thing to be able to do as well on the GMAT. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.